I'm John Cook. I'm from the University of Queensland and I also created Skeptical Science. And I research the psychology of misinformation and how people think about climate change. Skeptical Science began when I started getting into arguments with my father-in-law. Uh, he, would, he would, at family get-togethers, he'd start throwing different climate myths at me. And so then I would go home and start looking into the science behind these myths. And what I found was there really wasn't much science behind them at all. And so, like any son-in-law preparing for the next family get-together, I thought, well, I better not leave anything to chance. So I started building a list of all the different possible myths that might come up, and then collecting what the science said about each one. I was doing that for a while, and I was collecting peer-reviewed papers relevant to each different climate myth. And eventually I had a light bulb moment when I realised maybe other people would find this a useful resource as well. And so that's how Skeptical Science began. The concept was an encyclopedic reference. I just wanted to have myths and just keep adding myths and just uh, curate the information, gradually keep updating it as, as more science came in. Uh, while this was happening, I was becoming more and more aware of just how much misinformation is out there. And it's more than one person can deal with. So whenever people would come up to me and say, hey, the great side, you, you know, it's really important that you're doing this. And I would reply, thanks, uh, you want to help me do it? And you just cue running footsteps, car door slam and the, and the car drive down the street very quickly. And so for years, I was trying to get people to help me uh, develop this side, create the content, keep, keep rebutting new myths or rebutting old myths and wasn't really getting anywhere. And then one day I got an email from a physicist from Sydney, Michael Ashley, and he said, oh, I've read this great article on real climate by Gavin Schmidt. And Gavin suggested that what scientists need to do is communicate their science at three different levels, uh, or, or, or just at different levels. And, he, and Gavin used the metaphor of ski slopes, where you have the basic slope, the intermediate slope, and the advanced slope. And Michael said, you should do that with sceptical science. With all your rebuttals, you should have a basic, intermediate and advanced version. So that way you, you, have, you reach all different audiences. And what my first thought was just horror at the amount of work that that would be. But then the idea just kept festering away in the back of my mind. And it was compelling for two reasons. One was because one of the biggest challenges of science communication is working out that level to uh, communicate at. If you go too simple, then, then you risk oversimplifying the science and, and, and people who engage with the issue have no use for it. But if you try to make it more nuanced and complex for the, the more engaged audience, then it goes over the head of the people who are, just, uh, who are new to the issue. And so doing multi-level science communication is a way to have your cake and eat it too. So I was really attracted to that idea. But also I thought, this could be a, a catalyst moment in, in this attempt to get people helping me with sceptical science. So I posted on, on my website a blog post saying, hey, here's a great idea that Gavin Schmidt suggested, multi-level science communication, who's with me? And immediately, overnight, I got a flood of volunteers of people who thought they could do this, or who were interested in helping. So it was like a non-linear process. Of, rather than building a sceptical science team gradually overnight, it was more nothing, nothing, and woof, it, it just happened. And w looking back on it and reflecting, I think there's a big lesson there for just trying to get behaviour change. I think why people uh, were interested in this was because firstly they could see that they could do it. All I was asking was, let's take these intermediate level rebuttals and turn them into plain English versions. It was something people could visualise themselves doing. And also they could see that they could make a big difference with this. Having plain English rebuttals was something that could potentially have a big impact. Uh, the next step was suddenly I had all this enthusiasm and people wanting to do something. How I, I knew I had to harness all that energy and momentum quickly or, or it would dissipate and, and, and go to nothing. And so I quickly programmed up a forum where they could all, all the different authors could come together and, and work on, collaborate on, on writing all these, all these different rebuttals. The whole procedure was, was a bit like laying train tracks down before the train, trying to keep the, um, the momentum going. And there was a lot of late nights doing programming for the forum. And at one point, I was calling the bags under my eyes, Gavin and Schmidt. But I think that, that the end product was, it was really a game changer for sceptical science because what came out of that wasn't just all this great content, 
uh, it, it, overnight it formed a community of, of really passionate, intelligent and creative science communicators. And during all that, uh, during this development of uh, skeptical science, when was the first big media exposure the site got? The first um, media exposure that skeptical science got was when we released an iPhone app. So uh, several months previous, I got an email from a software company in Melbourne and the two owners of the company said, we're really passionate about climate change, we want to help. How about we take your skeptical science rebuttals, which are already on your website, and put them into an iPhone app. And so over a few months, uh, they asked me to take all my existing content and just put it into a data feed so that they could just pull that data and put it straight into the iPhone app. And when that came out, uh, and at that point we were fairly naive about me media, we didn't do hardly any promotion, but it got a lot of media attention. And it was really, that was the tipping point in terms of the number of people uh, coming to Skeptical Science. And then climate gate happened and then we saw another spike because interest in, in climate change spiked. And then it steadily increased. I think it's kind of plateaued in the last few years and I think it's getting around half a million visits or, or unique sessions is what tech eggheads would say uh, per month. So, um, so, so that's, that's quite high but the, what I think is interesting is the real impact that skeptical science makes is when our content gets used by other people. So when teachers use it in the classroom, when professors use it in their college classes, when scientists use our, our graphics in their PowerPoint slides. One of the uses of our, our material that we got a big kick out of was when Senator Whitehouse gave a speech on the Senate floor and, and he was explaining the realities of climate change and the ways that climate deniers cast out on the science. And he used a graph that we've been published on Skeptical Science. It's actually one of the most popular graphs. It was a, a graph created by Dana Nicitelli from an idea suggested by Bob Lacatina. And we call it the escalator. And what it shows is temperature going up over the last um, 50 years, but it doesn't just go up in a straight line. It goes up, wobbles up and down. And so when you have temperature going up like that, it's possible to find short periods any time through a warming period where it's actually going down. And Dana um, created it as an animated GIF. So he showed the escalator and then he showed the long-term warming trend. And so Senator the White House took this graph, but he was just doing it on card in, in the, the Senate floor. So an animated GIF wasn't really possible. So what he did was he showed the, the graph with the down escalator and then he had an assistant or someone take that down and quickly put up the next one, which just showed the warming trend, which is, I guess, how they do animation on the Senate floor. But that's not our target audience with Skeptical Science. Our target audience is the undecided majority, people who are trying to make sense of all this noise. Skeptical Science isn't about curing science denial. It's really about inoculating the rest of the population, reducing the influence of misinformation on the large majority. How do you see the future of skeptical science? Uh, the future for us in the short term is um, we're developing a, a MOOC, a massive online open course. In the short term this is about taking our rebuttals, uh, putting them in video form which is a new form of science communication that we're not that familiar with but we're just starting to see the power in it. And, and we're going through like a top 50 climate myths. It's really the skeptical science website in video form. Uh, that's really just the first step. Like we're hoping that the MOOC goes well, that lots of people use it uh, or enrol it in it. And, and that just in that first course that a lot of people uh, learn about climate science and also learn about the critical thinking skills to perceive when the science is getting distorted. If we only teach how the, what the science says, but don't explain to people how that science gets distorted, then they have no way of making sense of misinformation when it comes at them. And so teaching that critical thinking skills through misconception-based learning is a really important part of education. So this MOOC is not just about getting that information out there. It's also about in encouraging and promoting this type of teaching, which is addressing the misconceptions and that's really the only way that in the long term we can counter climate denial.
Why did you start Skeptical Science? Because I'm an idiot? <laughs> All right. Um. <laughs> we have that on tape now. You do know that, right?